Again, we come to the final letter that Jesus writes to these seven churches, seven specific churches. And as we'll see, this church is in the worst condition of all. Um, probably you have a title in your Bible, the lukewarm church. Um, I, I titled this the uh, nauseating church. I uh, had another title that I thought, well, better not go with that one. And that was the puke warm church. <laughs> But uh, Jesus has nothing good to say about this church. In fact, Jesus is not even inside of this church. Uh, we saw in Matthew's gospel, the last book we were in, that Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, and that doesn't just mean you throw the name of Jesus out there, in Jesus' name, that's not what he's referring to. You gather in his nature, in his character, you're gathering together, as if Jesus was there, and he is. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in your midst. He's not in the midst of this church we're going to look at. They were throwing his name around, but they were not truly saved. Now, remember when we started looking at the seven churches, Jesus picks them for a lot of different reasons. Uh, number seven, used 54 times in Revelation. It's the number of completeness. And so through these seven churches, he gives us a complete picture of the church down through the ages. We saw these also represent different church time frames from Pentecost to the rapture. Uh, they also are different. Um, the names are very significant. That's why he chose them, because there was bigger churches, more important churches, you might say, more popular churches, but he chose these for various reasons. Um, the first one we saw, Ephesus, their name means desired ones. They represent the first century church, and even towards the end of the first century, they were starting to leave their first love, that love relationship with Christ. So he says, this one thing I'm against you, doing a lot of good stuff, but you left your first love. So he calls them to remember where they have fallen, repent, do the first works. So desired ones, that's what Ephesus means. And then uh, starting around 64 AD till 313 AD was the persecution of the church where 10 different uh, Caesars persecuted and martyred 6 million Christians. Smyrna is the second letter. And Smyrna, they get their name from myrrh, which is a fragrance that comes when you crush and grind up this plant. And that's what Smyrna represents, this church that was crushed and put off this beautiful aroma as unto the Lord. And that speaks to persecuted churches down through the ages. Then we saw Perg Pergamos. Pergamos means thoroughly married. In 313 AD, uh, Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Not a good thing because they became thoroughly married to the Roman Empire, and that was a bad thing for the church. And then uh, we saw after Pergamos, Thyatira, representing the dark ages of the church, perpetual sacrifice. They were into idolatry, sacrificing to uh, false gods and goddesses. Sardis, they mean, uh, that means escaped ones. They represent the church time of the Reformation, they came out from the Thyatira system. Jesus says, you have a name that you're alive, but I say you're dead. It started off great. It was a wonderful move of God, but quickly dwindled. Last week, we looked at Philadelphia, one of the last days churches, along with the church of Laodicea. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Jesus promised that he would take them home before the great tribulation. And then we see with uh, this church this morning, Laodicea, their name means rule of the people the unfaithful church of the last days. And as we'll see, they do not want Jesus ruling over their lives. So, a very important letter we're going to look at this morning. Here's a couple of stories that illustrate where this church system is in the eyes of Jesus. There was a captain of this Navy ship, and he gives his young officer the task of navigating the ship out of the harbor for his very first time. And so the next day, the young, you know, um, whatever rank he was, young officer, he commands the orders. Let's get this thing going. All the, so, you know, men on crew, the crew, they step in line, they get everything going, and they get the ship, you know, undocked. They start heading out the harbor. They get out to open waters, and then the phone rings. And uh, the captain of the ship says, you're doing everything great, young man. Only one problem. 
Next time you take my ship out on open seas, make sure I'm on the boat. <laughs> and that's kind of the church of Laodicea. They're a uh, church without a savior, a church without the captain, Jesus. It reminds me of the story of the little girl who was asked to pray over a meal after they got home from church that Sunday afternoon. And she said, Lord, we had a great time at church today. I only wish that you had been there. That's the church of Laodicea. This church is mentioned four times in uh, the book of Colossae, the Colossian letter that Paul writes to them. Uh, in chapter 2 of Colossians, he says that he has great concern for the people of Laodicea. But then he says this in Colossians 4.16, Now when this epistle, this letter, is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, we don't have record of a church letter to Laodicea. Some think it might have been the letter to the Ephesians because that circulated the area as well. But be that as it may, the emphasis of Colossians is to prove that Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. Kind of goes along with the lady studying the book of Hebrews, greater than. He is preeminent over all things. Jesus is first and foremost in everything. He's the head over his church. He's the head over creation because he is the creator of all things. So that means we should constantly and consistently put Jesus Christ first and foremost in all that we do. He must be above everybody. He must be above everything in our lives. And so as Jesus writes this letter to the Laodiceans, it's about 35 years after Paul writes to the Colossians and that letter goes to the Laodiceans. And we'll see that this is a church that no longer is looking at Jesus as the preeminent one over their church or over their lives, but they have lifted themselves up into a place of prominence and they put themselves above Jesus. They put their philosophies above Jesus. They put their own ideas above the word of God. And so this church, like many churches we see in the world today, especially here in America, was in a spiritual free fall. They are in full-blown apostasy. And one of the signs of the last days is the apostasy of the church. Historically, the city of Laodicea was famous for a few things. It was a very wealthy city. It was like the Aspen or the Vale of its time. Uh, they were very rich, very wealthy. That was their mo motto. We're rich, we're wealthy, we're in need of nothing. In fact, they had an earthquake that leveled the city of Laodicea. They refused any outside help and they rebuilt the city. Um, unfortunately, that mindset carried over to their spiritual life as well. The wealthier they became, the less dependent they were on Jesus Christ. The second thing Laodicea was famous for was they manufactured this um, black wool. It was very soft, very elegant wool. They exported it all over the Roman Empire. Jesus will allude to this when he tells them, you need to get from me white garments, which represents his holiness, his righteousness. They were also famous for their medical school, so if you believe in science, that, like they did, Jesus is going to say, uh, you need to get eye salve from me. Because they developed this eye salve in their medical school. And it was pretty, you know, it was effective in working against certain eye diseases back then. But they were very proud of the fact that they did the, these things. And Jesus says, you need eye salve that only I can provide because Jesus alone can open up our eyes to the things of God. Finally, they were known for having a very lousy water supply. Uh, their water was very dirty. It had the added bonus of smelling like sulfur. But again, uh, they were so wealthy, they built these aqueducts. One aqueduct went to Hierapolis, a nearby city, and they were famous for their hot springs. And then their sister city, Colossi, they were known for their cold springs, but in both cases, by the time the hot water got from Hierapolis to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. The cold water from Colossae, by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And so Jesus will mention that in this letter as well. You know, it's been said that Christians are a lot like coffee. You know, piping hot 
is good and delicious on a cold day like today. Uh, iced coffee is refreshing and delicious on a hot summer day. But lukewarm coffee is kind of like gag me with a spoon. Um, my wife loves coffee and tea, piping hot, and so I make her a cup of coffee every morning, but I guarantee it's going to be in the microwave at least twice before she finishes it. It's got to be hot. Prophetically, this church is one of two churches that show us the, the last days of church history. Again, we saw the Church of Philadelphia as the faithful church. Jesus promised them in chapter 3, verse 10, he was going to remove them before the great tribulation, the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. He's going to take them out from among this world. But this church represents the apostate church of the last days. Philadelphia kept God's word. Philadelphia cherished God's word. Philadelphia loved the Bible. They kept the message of the cross at the center of their lives, and they lived for the risen Savior and we saw that they were expectantly waiting and watching for Jesus Christ at any moment. Laodicea, they represent the last day's church that has rejected the simple truth of God's word. They have basically put Jesus, the biblical Jesus, out of their midst. And they have created, and we see this all around us today, they've created a Jesus it's not the Jesus of the Bible, but it's a Jesus they create into their image and likeness of what they want Jesus to be for them. And that's a dangerous thing. Their Jesus tolerates sin. Their Jesus is into every vain philosophy of man. Their Jesus just wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy, and if you're not, it's your lack of faith. Their Jesus wants you to understand that you need to discover your own divinity within you. To them, Jesus was not the only way to heaven, but everybody gets in. They just need to find their own path. They're all about human potential, coexisting. Why can't we all just get along? God loves everybody. It doesn't matter what they believe. Unfortunately, this Laodicean system is everywhere today. And they will soon find themselves welcoming the Antichrist into their midst because they're not truly born again, as we'll see. So look at verse 14, Revelation chapter 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So first he mentions the Amen. Jesus is the Amen. We're all familiar with that word. So often we'll use it as a little tagline at the end of our prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen. That's not what it's for. Amen means so be it or that is true. Jesus is saying to this church that is believing all these false things about him, I am the Amen. I am the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus says, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you, it's the same word, amen. Amen in the Greek. So to this church, Jesus is saying, this is the truth. I'm the final word. In other words, no more debate, no more discussion. You know, the ruling on the field stands because Jesus is the final Amen. Not my ideas, not my opinions, not, you know, this isn't true because I feel like it's true, which is where a lot of Christians are today. If I, it doesn't feel right that God would judge the world. It doesn't feel right that Jesus would come against my sin. It doesn't matter how you feel. What Jesus says goes. Notice it also says in verse 14, He is a faithful and true witness. This means Jesus is reliable. This means that he is faithful. It means he is the unchanging one. That's what true witness means. This is the one great thing about Jesus that I love so much. He never changes. He doesn't change. He's God. Always has been, always will be. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and forever. He is not evolving. He's not growing in his godhood. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When Philip asked Jesus to show him the Father and says, Oh, that'll be sufficient. Then we'll believe. Just show us the Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is, he was, he always shall be God. He's the unchangeable God. So what Jesus said 2,000 years ago in the Bible is also true and faithful today. He doesn't change with the times. He's not culturally relevant. Now, for us as believers, this should be an awesome thing to realize. He does not change because that means he doesn't change his mind about you. He still loves you. His grace is still sufficient. He still wants to save you if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. The free gift of salvation. He doesn't change his mind and take it away from you. But on the other hand, this is why churches like Laodicea and why the world in general don't want the biblical Jesus to be anywhere near them because Jesus won't change his mind about sin what he called sin 2,000 years ago is still sin today. What he says is right and wrong is still right and wrong today. These Laodiceans don't like the fact that they cannot make him go away. They can't vote Jesus out of office. But Jesus is immutable. That means he's unchanging. So as long as Jesus is around, he will speak the truth. He will challenge those who lie and this often offends people. And when I hear people say, well, Jesus would never offend anyone, then I instantly know they don't know the Jesus of the Bible because Jesus constantly offended people. He offended his hometown of Nazareth when he goes into the synagogue there and he takes a scroll of Isaiah. He finds himself where he's quoting himself out of the Old Testament. And then he says, this day this has been fulfilled in your midst. And they were offended by what he said. They take him to the cliff there in Nazareth, which is, you know, we were there last time we were in Israel. We'll probably be there this time. There's a long, big cliff there. They were going to throw him off the cliff because they were offended. But he snuck through their midst and left. The Jews were offended. Twice we're told they picked up stones to stone him. What good thing are you, you know, what good work are you stoning me for? Not because of any good work, but you being a man, make yourself God. That was very offensive to them. When the Jews finally do get their hands on him, they persuade Pontius Pilate to have him crucified because he was so offensive to the Jewish religious leaders. Peter quotes the prophet Isaiah and says he was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So yes, Jesus will offend you if you are disagreeing with him. Guess who's wrong? Guess who's right? Jesus is always right. The end of verse 14, Jesus says he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, in no way does that mean Jesus is a created being. In fact, the word beginning is a Greek word, arche. That's where we get the word for architect. In other words, Jesus is the architect. He's the designer and the creator of everything in the universe. So Jesus has preeminence over all things. The Bible is clear about this. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says of Jesus, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And notice, and without him, nothing was made that was made. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, oh, he's a created being, and then he made everything else. No, nothing that was made has been made without Jesus. He has made it all. He's a creator of all things. Remember, Paul's letter to the Colossians was to be read to the church of Laodicea. One of the most important things in that letter is Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. It says this, For by him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, so the entire universe, visible and invisible, the spiritual realm as well, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And that truth of the preeminent one, Jesus, has been lost 
by the church of Laodicea. They've forgotten all about who Jesus really is. They no longer look at Jesus as the one who is preeminent over their lives, and so they've pushed him out of their midst, out of their church. Their attitude is, we are now in control, and we tell Jesus what to do and how to do it. And there are a lot of churches, even in this valley, that have that mindset. We're king's kids. We're going to tell him what to do and how to do it. Like they got a little magic lamp and rub it and poof, get your three wishes. Healthy, wealthy, and whatever I want. I'm a king's kid. I'm going to demand these things. And Jesus will show them where they're off base. Remember, Laodicea means the rule of the people. And so instead of believing that Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator, some Laodiceans are believing the lie of evolution. There's a lot of churches that believe in evolution, and Jesus isn't the creator of all things. So they place an unprovable science fiction story over God and his word. If you can believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the rest of the Bible is pretty easy to follow. So instead of believing that Jesus is also the creator of life in the womb, some Laodiceans will say, we're in control. We'll do with whatever we want with our bodies, my body, my choice. There's a lot of churches that are promoting choice over the fact that that baby is a creation in the womb by God. This is why Jesus has nothing good to say with this church system. They don't want the amen, the faithful and true witness, anywhere near them. So how do you think this makes Jesus feel? And I'm using that metaphorically. How does this make Jesus feel? Look at verse 15. He's very clear on this. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What an amazing description Jesus has for this lukewarm church. And again, I thought better of it not to call it the pukewarm church, but same thing. He says this church is not hot. The Greek word for hot is zestos. It means boiling hot, on fire, zestos. Um, Jonah and I, my grandson, we were up fishing Tuesday, and there's a stream that flows into Vega. The stream looks really clean. And it's like, Jonah, you don't ever drink water out of that. You know, you don't go down there. It looks good. But guess what happens if you drink that? It's going to make you sick. There could be jardia. There can be all kinds of stuff, nasty stuff in there. So even though it might look good, it might look clean and refreshing, microbes can really make you sick. Laodicea, they're full of spiritual microbes and germs and bacteria. They're full of false doctrines which lead to false beliefs, which leads to living a false lifestyle that is opposed to God and his word. So being lukewarm, that's the perfect condition for all kinds of spiritual bacteria to grow, to flourish, unbiblical ideas and behaviors breed. So this church was not hot, not on fire for Jesus. Paul says it like this in Romans 12, starting in verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That's Philadelphia. We looked at that church last week, brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The word fervent means to be hot or boiling hot. Jesus wants us to be sold out to him, totally on fire, totally in love with him. Again, it all comes down to his desire to be in close fellowship with us. That's why he created us, was for fellowship. But this church didn't want that. They wanted to tell Jesus what to do and how to do it. Jesus also says that he wishes this church was cold. What does that mean? Well, it would be better if they were unsaved than to be lukewarm. Because if they were unsaved, Jesus could still reach them and save them. The gospel is truly good news to those who know, I'm a sinner and I'm dying without salvation. I need the Savior. And they can get saved when they come to Christ. 
Being lukewarm towards Jesus is the most dangerous place you can be because lukewarm means you have cooled down to the very same temperature as the world around you. You're just like the world. Nobody can tell the difference if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. You do, you say, you act just like the world, and nobody can see any difference. That's a dangerous place to be. So this is a wake-up call for some of us in here. There's virtually no difference to who you are and how you live and what you believe as the culture around you. It's being in a place of indifference or apathy where you're neither against Jesus, but you're really not excited to be identified with Jesus. It's where people have just enough religion to make them feel safe, but they're not really born again. They're in the category of a make-believer, but not a genuine believer, and it's because of their lukewarm condition that Jesus says here, notice again, if you didn't notice the first time, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Pretty picture to think of just before lunch. I can't think of Jesus giving us a more graphic description than this. When you've got something that is harming your physical body, you've got to get it out. So a good definition of vomiting, <laughs> if you don't already know, is simply a, a violent expulsion of whatever is making you sick. So Jesus is saying to this compromising, bacteria-filled church, you make me nauseated. Again, metaphorically, Jesus is God. He doesn't get sick, but he says, you call me Lord, but you don't obey my word. You call me Savior, but you continue to live in the sins that I died on the cross to set you free from. You say you believe the Bible, but you don't take a stand on anything. There's no lines drawn. You think sexual immorality is no big deal with me. You think... You know, abortion is no big deal with me. You're no different than the lost, depraved world. That's the church of Laodicea. Their lukewarmness is so nauseating to Jesus that a time will come when he expels them from his midst. We saw this in Matthew's gospel. Remember in Matthew 7 where Jesus is saying, there'll be many in that day that'll come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? Throwing his name out there, we cast out demons in your name. We perform signs and wonders in your name. We prophesied in your name. And then what does Jesus tell them? Matthew 7, 23. And then I will declare to them, this is the Laodicean church, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Depart from me. That's vomiting them out of his midst. And so... Take heed to Jesus' warnings. He told the church of Ephesus that unless they repented, he would remove his lampstand from its place, which means they would quickly wither and die. To the church of Pergamos, he said, Repent, or else I will fight against you with the sharp two-edged sword that comes out of my mouth, which is the word of God. To Thyatira, he says that if you do not repent, you're going into the great tribulation. So Jesus isn't messing around with these seven churches. Now, at the same time, this is very important to hear, don't beat yourself up when you have a down day. Don't beat yourself up if you're going through a hard season of life. We all have days where we're on fire for the Lord, and then we have days when we're not on fire for the Lord. That's just the normal ups and downs of living in this fallen world. But Jesus is referring to a church system and to individuals who constantly and consistently are indifferent towards the Lord. They're indifferent towards His Word. They could care less what God's Word says. They're self-deceived. They're ignorant of the truth. And here's the reason why. Look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, this is their motto, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is a scary and dangerous place to be. They say, he says, but they don't even know. They say they're this way, but they don't even know. No, this is how Jesus sees them. Hourly, hourly they would be saying, I'm good. I'm okay. I attend an exciting church. Oh, definitely, I'm a Christian. But Jesus sees right through the outward veneer. He says, you don't even know 
that you're miserable, poor, wretched, blind, naked. In other words, that was the truth of where they were spiritually in the eyes of Jesus. I'm convinced that churches like Laodicea think very highly of themselves. They're probably one of the most positive churches you could ever find. All their messages are positive. All their worship is positive. But in God's eyes, they are positively wrong in what they did and what they believed. All their sermons are about living your best life now. I hope that's offensive. How they needed to discover their own human potential and giftings. That they were champions for the kingdom of God, but they would never talk about sin. They'll never talk about repentance. They'll never talk about your need to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus, denying yourself. They'll never talk about the count of cost, the, the, counting the cost of living for Christ. We know that their focus is all about themselves because Jesus will say in verse 20, I'm not even in your midst. I'm not even in your church. You kick me out and I'm on the door knocking, hoping someone will let me in. I believe the leaders of these churches are going to bear the harshest judgment from God and it's simply because they're not giving people the word of God. Well, they throw the word out there. If they ever do teach from the Bible, it's usually little bits and pieces that will endorse or promote or support their me-centered agenda, make me feel good about my sinful condition. What a sad thing it is to go to a church expecting to hear the Word of God taught, explained, brought to life by the Holy Spirit, but they don't even open the Bible. And when they do open the Bible, they get a vignette, a little sermonette for a Christianette. And it's very sad. James 1.23 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. What's the purpose of a mirror? Well, it simply reflects what's our outward condition. Some mornings when I get up and I look in the mirror, that's rather depressing. You look in the mirror, ugh. I was hoping for something a little better than this. But a mirror not only shows us what's wrong, but it also shows us what's right. That's God's word. And that's why James likens the word of God to a mirror. It not only shows us where we're doing things right, but it also reveals where we're off base. So the problem with churches like Laodicea is they're not getting nor hearing the word of God. And so they were simply hearing what the culture is about. They're simply reflecting what the culture is about instead of reflecting Jesus. This is why it's so important to teach the whole counsel of God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. After all, there is a big difference, and this is not splitting hairs, there's a big difference between teaching from the Bible and teaching the Bible. Because when we teach the Bible, we're forced to study everything God has to say to us, instead of just picking and choosing our favorite topics. 2 Timothy 3.16, the Apostle Paul says, All Scripture, for us that's Genesis to Revelation, is given by inspiration of God, it's God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, well, I just want to be made uh, to feel good about myself. Well, maybe you need to be corrected. Reproof for something you're doing wrong. That's what God's Word does. Reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, how to live for the Lord. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible comforts us, it encourages us, it rebukes us, it corrects us and convicts us because it's the mirror of the Bible that shows me you know, before you're saved, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. It shows me now, as a believer, that I need to look to the Lord for wisdom, for discernment, for strength. I need to be nourished and fed and changed by the Holy Spirit in order for me to be able to navigate this crazy, tricky, deceived world. This church is self-deceived. It does not want to hear the truth of God's Word. And so they wrongly believe that their material wealth 
equals spiritual wealth. They wrongly believe that their physical material wealth equates to, we're doing great spiritually, look how much we got. Look how big our house is. Look how many cars we got. Look how all the riches we have in this world. This is an indictment against the Word of Faith movement. Their mantra is God wants all of us to be healthy and wealthy because we are king's kids. And if you're not healthy and wealthy today, it's because of your lack of faith. That is from the pit of hell. That is not from the Word of God. Every one of us in here... As Americans, we are wealthier than 90% of the world. God wants us to be good stewards over what He has entrusted to us, but don't ever equate your material blessings with your spiritual well-being. Jesus' perspective here, He tells them, you are wretched, miserable, poor, even though they had a lot of material wealth, blind and naked. If you want to see what these false teachers are all about, when you get home, just read through 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, it's all about false teachers, and the biggest thing you'll see in there is they're all trying to make money off of you. That's one of the biggest signs of being a false teacher. It's all about the Benjamins. Paul says this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Jesus warns about the deceitfulness of riches because it chokes out the word. Remember when he talks about the sower putting the seed in the ground, the deceitfulness of riches. It's like the weeds that will choke out the life of the word. Yes, God has blessed people with great wealth. Many Christians are very wealthy, but whatever and however God blesses us, He wants us to be good stewards with the blessings He's entrusted to us and never forget that He has blessed us, Ephesians 1-3, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's infinitely more valuable than all the money Bill Gates and these clowns have. Don't you look at them. If, they, if, if wealth was a sign of spirituality, those guys are missing it by a long shot. Well, look at verse 18. Here's Jesus' counsel to these groups. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So again, he tells them to buy from him that which cannot be purchased. It's a free gift. Gold speaks of godly character that Jesus develops within us as we go through the fiery trials. White garment speaks of our robes of righteousness that he gives us at the moment of salvation. We'll see this in chapter 19 as well. Um... When we come to Christ, He anoints our eyes with real eye salve so that we can see the love of Christ. We can experience and see His grace working in us, at work upon us. He says in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. For all you ladies in Hebrews, this will line up with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, where, you know, the writer says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Whom the Lord loves, he rebukes, because we're his children. He spanks us when we need it. That's a good thing. So here he says, therefore, be zealous and repent. You know, this is one of the most amazing verses in this section here, because despite everything this church is doing wrong, he has not yet puked them out of his mouth. He's not done with them yet. Not until they die, then it all hits the fan. He's still giving them a chance to repent and come to Him for salvation. Listen, God does not want to destroy anybody, but you have to come to Jesus before it's too late. And there is a cost. The cost is your pride. The cost is your self-sufficiency. You have to come to Jesus in all your sinfulness, with all your flaws, you need to humble yourself before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and He will. You ask Him to save you, and He will. This is the whole basis of John 3.16. For God so loved the world 
The world means everybody who's been on this planet. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever, that whoever is all inclusive, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's his promise to those who will truly humble themselves and say, Lord, I cannot save myself. I cannot earn my way to heaven. You humbly come before him and he will save you. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Some of you have seen that famous painting where Jesus is on the outside of the church knocking on a door. There's no doorknob. He's not going to open it himself. He's not going to kick it down. But he's knocking on the door. Well, here's where it comes from. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In context, it's he's outside this church. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with my, me on my throne. And as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So even though the picture here is of Jesus standing on the outside of the church, gently knocking on the door, his hope is if anyone that speaks of any individual inside that church, if anyone will hear my voice, any individual in this lukewarm condition, hears my voice and opens the door, he says, I will come into him. I will come into that individual person. I will dine with him and he with me. And so, yes, Jesus is on the outside of this church, this church system. But if any individual hears Jesus knocking, and yes, I believe this can be a picture of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. If you will open your heart to Jesus, he will come into your life. We see pictures of this in the Gospel of John. This is what Jesus says to his disciples, including us, of the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 17. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit, who's been knocking on the door of your heart, bringing conviction of sin into your life, when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you and he seals you into the body of Christ. You're now born again. A few verses later, Jesus says to one of the disciples, John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we, the Father and Jesus, will come to him and make our home with him. So this is what we mean when we say Jesus loves you. He demonstrated his love for you by dying on the cross for your sins. And because he rose from the dead, he alone can give you everlasting life. And so if you open up your life to him, your heart to him, you receive him as Lord and Savior, he will come in and he will change you. He will save you. And I love this phrase. He says, and I will dine with him and he with me. To dine with someone meant that you would be in fellowship with that person. To dine with someone means you're going to share a meal with someone. When we take communion together, that's what it means. Communion means fellowship. That's what the words mean. And so I will have fellowship with you. Remember, Jesus got, well, he offended people in the Gospels because he would eat with sinners and tax collectors. And the religious leaders, doesn't he know those people are sinners? Doesn't he know who he's eating with? Of course he does. Jesus would eat every meal alone if he didn't eat with sinners like us. Because we're all sinners. And yet, he says, when you come to me, I will dine with you. I will have intimate fellowship with you. And by his grace, notice what he says there in verse 21. Jesus will grant us to sit with him on his throne in glory. It's not my divine right. I'm going to sit with Jesus on his throne because I'm a king's kid. No, he grants that to us. We don't tell him what to do and how to do it. We humble ourselves before him. And so we will get to sit with him on his throne in glory. Don't ask me what that looks like because I have no idea. 
billions of people sitting with Jesus on his throne. The old mound? I don't know. Or we each get a day on the throne with Jesus throughout eternity? I don't know. But it's going to be great. And next week, we're going to be with Jesus in glory. That's not a prediction of the prophet uh, of the rapture. <laughs> that just means we go into chapter 4, and John is going to be caught up into the presence of the Lord, and he's going to see Jesus on the throne in glory. That's where we're going to be, Lord willing, next week. Amen.